Hi, everyone, and welcome to our session on games for remote learning. We're so pleased to be with you all, even if it's virtual, which is definitely a new experience for us who have been attending Games for Change for many, many years. Uh, I'm Michelle Miller. I'm co-founder and CEO of Games and Learning, and I'm very happy to be joined uh, by my colleagues and my friends. Uh, Clarence Tan from Bottle Learning, Christina Oliver from Classroom Inc., and Grant Hosford from CodeSpark. And hi, everybody. And uh, they're all going to be sharing with you their lessons learned from adapting and evolving during the shift to remote learning, which has affected so many of us, both professionally and personally, in my case. Um, so the way we're going to do this is we're each going to provide a few minutes of context, which is a few slides, not too many. And then we're gonna jump into a discussion that I hope uh, you'll all want to join. So um, I'm gonna give you a, a, a cue in a little bit um, so you can think about your questions and you'll have a chance to submit your questions to the chat window. Um, and then we're gonna try to answer as many as we can. We have plenty of, that's time for that. Um, so let me start by telling you a little bit about what we do at Games and Learning. Um, and to do that, let me just make sure that show you our, our slides here. Um, sorry, one second. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about what we do at Games and Learning. Um, our goal is to help parents and teachers discover great digital learning content that benefits kids. Uh, we do that by curating and distributing outstanding web-based games and other tools. And right now we're developing a new service that distributes discounted digital learning subscriptions to kids in need. That's a work in progress. If you want to hear more, I'd be happy to tell you about it. Um, and just as a reminder, if you want to see the slides uh, in a larger format, you can double click. Um, and then to go back to see the video in a larger format, you can double click on the video. Um, so that work uh, that I just described is built on research that we conducted through a grant from the National Science Foundation, where we interviewed and we surveyed and we tested with uh, more than a thousand Title I educators. Um, based on that, uh, round of iterative development, we launched a new digital learning channel on the First Book Marketplace in February. Uh, for those of you who don't know, First Book is a network of now 475,000 educators who serve low income students. And through that pilot, we distributed more than 15,000 subscriptions. And then a few short weeks later, everything changed <laughs> for everyone, including us. Uh, so we very quickly shifted from what was an e-commerce focus to trying to help sort out all of the suddenly free remote learning tools. Um, and so we curated uh, various resources on gamesandlearning.co uh, and we provided parents and teachers with clear descriptions to help them know what to expect when they access these tools. Uh, but let's take a step back before we get ready to hear from the rest of the panel and uh, just take a minute to look at what did change in March of this year. Um, I know we all know this, but on some days it feels like a million years ago. You know, it's yesterday and also a million years ago. So, so let's review. Um, all of a sudden, 55 million U.S. students were learning at home. Administrators were very rapidly creating plans for remote learning that included the distribution of internet connected devices on top of all the other things that administrators were, were focused on. Um, teachers were suddenly setting up accounts in Google Classroom. They were figuring out how Zoom works. Um, they were trying to make sure every kid was checking in and was engaged in at least one way or another. Parents uh, were suddenly struggling with uh, new ways of trying to continue their work, whether they were going to work as essential workers or they were, and this really deserves air quotes, working from home, um, and trying to support their kids' learning and trying to keep everybody as sane as possible. Um, and meanwhile, to the credit of many, including uh, my friends on the panel today, ed tech providers unlocked free access to their products. They didn't just unlock free access. They also adapted their materials. They provided new levels of support. Um, they rose to the occasion in many ways that you're gonna hear about in just a minute. For many kids, particularly those in higher income households, it wasn't an ideal situation, but it was fine 
that's the term that was used in this parents together survey um, that I think is is a really good illustration of you know where you look at those making you know families making more than fifty thousand dollars a year or a hundred thousand dollars a year remote learning from them went okay right um, but for many other students um, remote learning, the shift to remote learning exacerbated pre-existing conditions. So we've been particularly interested in whether at-risk students are able to find and access content that will benefit them um, to help to mitigate what many researchers are, are seeing as uh, just profound levels of learning loss over and above what they were experiencing before. Um, and that connects to what devices have been distributed by their districts. So of the largest 25 uh, U.S. school districts, the school districts with the, with the highest student populations, of those, 45% uh, reported that during this time they've been distributing Chromebooks, and that includes a $17 million spend by LA Unified. Um, meanwhile, only 11% reported distributing iPads, even though uh, that 11% is a significant financial investment because New York City, as reported by Mayor de Blasio, spent $269 million on 300,000 iPads. So iPads are a big deal in New York City, less so in the rest of the country where it really is more uh, Chromebooks. So we see both an urgent need and an opportunity. Uh, districts have distributed by our count, and this number is increasing every day. So it's very, it was very difficult to, to lock this slide because it really is a, a daily, uh, we have to update it daily. Uh, but right now, our calculation is more than 2.4 million remote learning devices have been distributed since March of this year. Uh, we also know that hundreds of thousands of families have been given free hotspots or free access to Wi-Fi in one way or another. Um, and for many of us who've worked in this space for longer than we care to admit, more than a decade, uh, we know that this shift towards truly one-to-one -one devices, discussions around blended learning, um, the involvement of parents in their children's media choices, those all have the potential to add up to significant impact in ways we really couldn't imagine even a year ago or two years ago. Um, and also could result in long-term shifts, positive shifts, I believe, for the industry. So for more on that, I'm gonna turn to our panel and we're gonna proceed in the same order as uh, this slide. So first up, we have Clarence Tan from Bottle Learning. Uh, welcome, Terrence. Clarence, sorry. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Clarence. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Bottle Learning. So we have a gaming platform for education that makes um, learning fun and personalized. So what we do is we use gameplay um, to make practice and assessment items and instructional content really fun. And then we run all of it through uh, machine learning to essentially identify where gaps are for kids, um, you know, adapt the content to match every single kid um, individually. Um, what's really special, in my opinion, uh, with our program, there's two things. One is obviously our characters. And so just with the background, um, we're called Bottle because we have these bottle-headed game characters. And we created bottle heads because as kids learn, their heads will start filling up. And then when their heads are all filled up, they get poured back out to grow trees, plants, and stuff and make the world a better place. So that was the story and message that we wanted to give students but also especially in this political landscape uh, we wanted to you know let students and kids understand that you know when you look at a bottle what really matters about the bottle is what's on the inside the character the you know what who they are on the inside and we really wanted to make sure that um, we emphasize. Um, so that's the first thing uh, we love our characters uh, the second thing is our technology we we built it in a way that allows uh, other content providers to put in their e-learning content. So hopefully, fingers crossed, when we do uh, start looking to partner with more homeschool content providers or bigger publishers, they can take their existing assessment items and content and load it into our gameplay experience. So that's essentially uh, our avenue of growth. Um, and then we'll jump to the next slide. 
Um, yep. So yeah, we are a relatively new company. We are part of the AT and T as part of really for ed tech um, companies. Um, kind of like what Michelle had highlighted really early on. Everybody was um, to offer their programs um, counted rate. Um, so for the most part, for us, the sales cycle ended. We wanted to make sure that we're able to, you know help as many classrooms like the 1700 that we had initially um with uh impact with more kids so what we first we made bottle temper free and then we started hitting a lot of um facebook groups a lot of emails um and t to tell parents primarily was just uh, to about our program and then yeah within 40 1700 um kids to over housing and yeah, it was it was really it was really shocking for us. Um, and then that's when we really ramped up our live support. Um, we have a like a live chat button. And then as soon as we started hearing and, and talking to um, people who are using our program, very quickly we found out that it was about fifty five percent teachers to forty five percent parents. So initially we had only intended on serving um, um, teachers and that's where we found wow this is actually affecting a lot of parents as well and um, that was where as a startup we knew that hey you know this is one of those things that it's gonna we think it's gonna change the education landscape for a while so this is one where we really have to understand and listen to our customers so we ramped up our life support prioritize our customer feedback and what we found was that um, a lot of uh, um, Pretty much learning going remote teachers aren't able to necessarily that's building more gameplay like we had originally we had to build instructional content so that if kids do need help or if they struggle in, in a small area they would have that on-demand um, support um, we also what we learned was um, yeah a lot of parents did not have access to Chromebooks or or they would use mobile devices. So that's where we started ramping up our mobile development. So we should be in a mobile version, to, hopefully towards the, uh, the earlier mid. Yeah, and then yeah, we, we were able to speak to over 1600 um, parents and teachers personally, um, and it has been uh, good for us to kind of design features that teachers wanted themselves when they uh, that they have experienced in this remote learning experience. Um, we can jump on to the next slide. So there are a couple big lessons learned, of, especially for um, for us as a company. The first one was, especially when everything is so fast paced now, um, onboarding has to really be seamless. Uh, for the first couple of weeks, we had about a 7% um, active user rate. And then it took us about a little under a month to really talk to uh, our, our users to see, you know, certain buttons that have to automatically show. We had to build specific for automated um, processes to help um, improve the onboarding experience. So we went from percent of people who signed active users to 24%. Um, something that we heard found really, we found really interesting was the importance of engagement. So before, when we used to pitch and talk to schools and parents, it was mostly, you know, it wasn't that engagement was not important. It was, it was more so that before it was uh, like state standards or curriculum or specific classroom tools that teachers see. Now, when we talk to parents and teachers, the number one thing that they always answer when we ask, "Hey, why why did you choose us?" was, "Oh, it was so fun. Uh, the kids love it. Engagement has been such a big portion because." Kids aren't signing up on, you know, other e-learning products um, that you know are not that interesting. And I will say that the, the last thing that we um, found um, was the need for um, adaptive and personalized learning today, especially when you know teachers aren't in the classroom with the kids helping one on one. Um, so that has uh, been some of the very interesting learnings so far. We've had a lot of teachers that are not used to the concept of you know every, the the program adapting to the kids so it was like oh you mean like they were t they would tell me technically i don't have to create assignments the product would adjust to my kid i'm like yeah that that, that actually works so um, they came in for the engagement but they stayed for the personalized instruction 
Great. Thank you so much, Clarence. I have a lot of follow-up questions for you <laughs> coming soon. Uh, but next we're gonna go to Christina Oliver from Classroom Inc. Christina, do you wanna tell us about Read to Lead? Christina, you're on mute. Um, Christina, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Error number one. No. Hi, everyone. I'm Christina Oliver. I'm the executive director at Classroom Inc. We're an EdTech nonprofit um, that designed, developed, and launched Read to Lead um, a few years ago in 2017. Um, and basically, Read to Lead is an educator platform. Our focus is middle school. Uh, we're using proven game based learning models and formative data to both increase time spent reading and improve critical thinking and problem solving skills. Um, and we do that in a pretty unique format. Uh, you can head to the next slide. Uh, that unique floor format is utilizing the workplace. So putting students in the role of the boss. I um, mean, again, our target is really fifth grade through ninth grade. Um, as the boss, students are become the boss. They are making decisions, solving real world workplace problems, and so they have to read closely, they have to weigh evidence, um, and they can make the wrong decision or maybe not the best decision in a really safe environment. Um, so we're really emphasizing reading, critical thinking, problem solving, and that career exposure component. Uh, you can head to the next slide. Thanks, Michelle. Um, our our uh, industries are the um, health professions. You can be a medical professional. You can be a journalist uh, at this moment, um, and you can run a community-based organization. So lots of really relevant topics for this moment um, in, in all of our lives. Um, in terms of what we did um, during, uh, in response, I guess, to COVID-19, you can head to the next slide. Um, we basically we were always planning to launch a reskin or uh, to improve the onboarding experiences for teachers across the U.S. Uh, we happened to plan to launch that in March, uh, and thankfully the timing um, from a obviously from a business perspective was was really great. Which is we saw as many as many of my colleagues did increased activations, um, not only increased registration, but most importantly, increased activations, and this need that parents have, have expressed over and over. I'm also a parent of middle school students, so I'm living this, uh, this need, uh, which is the need for um, um, content that, as you already said, Clarence, is super engaging. So we saw more episodes, the way our um, content exists is you can you can play 12 days at work up to actually 30 days at work and we saw more and more episodes being played of our content to the next slide um, and of course we really wanted to make sure that the world knew we existed um, and so we launched we heavily marketed distance learning uh, we too utilized um, a lot of the social media platforms which have been really effective for us um, and have seen a, a dramatic increase in our in our registrations over these last few months. Um, I one thing I failed to mention is uh, read to lead learning games are free. Um, so uh, we, in addition to continuing to to offer our learning games for free, we also increase the amount and the type of professional development. So uh, we have a bunch of virtual coaches that are working with educators across the country. Tons of work in supporting educators on the distance learning front um, and really meeting a lot of varied need, needs there. In addition, you know, as a middle school content provider, um, parents are really advocates for us, but we this was an opportunity to really branch out. And so we did find that we were, we were um, conducting more professional development, sometimes with parents, teachers, and students together, which actually was fascinating. Um, but that ultimately parents are really advocates at this age group. Um, and for us, not necessarily um, a customer base. Our, our just content is really designed for an English language arts teacher in the middle school classrooms. And so it really, it did reinforce, I think, our value, our value prop. Um, and yeah, and I think the, the PD piece was just really interesting in that, again, lots more um, across the country and many different regions, and also allowed us that 
which we, we usually have, but at a much greater level, allowed us some real time um, learning and feedback from the, the teachers primarily that we were working with. Next slide. And I think where we're headed um, and what we continue to hear from teachers and frankly parents is that our characters have always been culturally diverse. Uh, the issues that students are facing within the situational workplace experience are highly relevant uh, for the moment. Restorative justice, um, anxiety are all content that actually um, are part of our stories right now. Um, and so, uh, linking that and making sure that educators across the country know that this is one way that they can have free access to really proven research-based content to meet these three needs is something that we're really focused on as we head out into the fall. And I will echo um, what Clarence said um, before closing out, which is um, most of our content is um, it's browser-based. Um, so uh, we're really um, elevating and escalating our development to meet the need for mobile um, as well, knowing that that obviously is truly trying, you know, truly will allow us to bridge that that digital divide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we'll definitely, I think uh, we're getting some questions related to devices, Christina, so we can follow up on that in the Q&A. Uh, thank you, Christina. And last but not least, Grant Hosford from CodeSpark. Grant, can you tell us a little bit about what you've been doing for the past few months? Nothing. Yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, barely staying above water. Um, so I was going to offer a bribe to everybody who's on the session right now. If you stick with us to the end, I'll bring our new eight week old puppy what? London on screen. Um, so it's flat out bribe. If you want to see the puppy, you got to stay to the end. Um, so, uh, CodeSpark is a multi-platform tool for uh, K through five computer science learning. And it works on iOS, Android, Chromebooks, um, and well, any browser-based compute, you know, uh, platform. Um, and when this hit, you know, we were already free for um, public school teachers. So you could use the CodeSpark platform, all of the related curriculum, um, all of the teacher, other teacher support for free. What we didn't have was a way for teachers to easily um, act, you know, help students access the platform from home. And so we scrambled in the first week of the stay at home orders and changed the way our code system works so that um, teachers could easily create codes that would allow kids to log in at home. And what, this is on my end slide, but you know, one of the things we learned is that for K through five kids, especially K through three, logging in is hard. Like so many of our teachers just uh, struggled to get kids to do basic things because they aren't there next to them. And the kid who is the helper kid that knows how to log in, that go, walks around and helps the other five kids figure out what they're doing, you know, is also not there, right? So um, it, like little things became big things really quickly. And I would call what we did in the spring emergency learning. Um, you know, it was everyone doing their best, teachers doing their best, uh, school districts doing their best, providers doing their best. Um, and it probably wasn't nearly good enough, frankly, from any of us. I think, you know, some of us were more ready to respond than others, but um, it was a really, it, it was a really tough time. And the other thing I'll mention is, you know, we learned really quickly that not only were low income students without access to devices and internet being left out, but any kid with any kind of learning challenge was also uh, being, you know, left out, you, you know, if they needed extra support, if they needed extra time, it just, it just was very difficult for a lot of teachers and parents. Um, I do think we'll be better off in the fall. I don't think it'll be perfect. But for example, you know, we reached out and surveyed our teachers about what they needed most from us. And a lot of it was practical. Like we um, didn't have passwords on our individual student profiles before, because in a classroom setting, you know, kids were good. They, they didn't do silly things to other people's accounts. Uh, when you're at home and no one's watching you and you can go poke around in your neighbor's accounts, um, 
you know, silly things happen. So there's a, there's a lot of that just, you know, making sure we're in constant communication with our teachers uh, and our parents and, and understanding what they need. The other thing we did back in the spring was we changed our development priorities. And much like uh, Clarence and Christina, we, we added three full-time people in customer care immediately, which may not sound like a lot, but we were a 14-person company at the time. We're now a 26-person company because of COVID. Um, we, so that was huge, right? And we tried to answer people's questions in, in real time. Um, we also put out new content that allowed kids to have coding battles with each other in real time, which was a first for us. So we introduced what we call multiplayer capability. And we're refining that for the fall so that if you want to play against someone in your classroom, uh, you can. So like if, you know, Michelle and I were in the same class, we could have a little coding battle and uh, work together. Um, can you go to my first slide, mm -hmm. Michelle? Yeah. Cool. So um, for those of you who don't know the platform, there's kind of two pieces to it. There's a kid facing interface that is largely word free, which is why it works for, you know, kids as young as kindergarten. It also works for kids with reading related challenges, dyslexia, ADHD, et cetera. Um, and the focus of the platform is to create with code. And when I say code, it's a, you know, visual icon based language that we created focused on fundamentals. Then we also have a teacher dashboard that allows for the free access, this, you know, establishment of a classroom, uh, progress tracking curriculum, you know, how does curriculum tie to standards and access to our online professional development. Um, we, made professional development free during uh, the, re, you know, the last part of the school year. And we had over 4,000 teachers complete the online course, which is crazy impressive because it's an eight hour course. Um, and it's all about bringing computational thinking into the classroom. We will make that free again uh, in the fall. And actually, if you just contact us, we'll give you a free code. I think technically our system is set up to charge 120 bucks, but if you contact us, we'll, we'll make it free. Um, let's go to the next slide. Uh, yeah, so, um, you know, this is, I've already kind of talked about this, but um, the other thing we did is we knew that, uh, you know, some teachers would have trouble getting online. Coding is a increasingly important, but not completely core uh, subject for elementary school. And we knew lots of teachers would just be scrambling to handle, you know, English, social studies, etc. And so for all the parents who are just looking for smart screen time for their kids, we launched heavy B2C discounts. And those are actually still up on our site in our blog. So if you go to codespark.com, those discounts on our annual plan are, are still there. Um, and let's go, let's go to the next one. By the way, the coding game is pretty fun. The, the, it's a water balloon fight. Everything we do is very kid friendly and, uh, you know, appropriate. Um, but if you, you know, if you need to get out some angst and throw water balloons at your son, daughter, partner, whatever, you can play splash clash on code spark. Um, so, Another thing we found is that the lessons that worked well in the classroom, uh, many of them, frankly, just did not work well uh, in an at-home situation. And so we uh, have spent time this summer coming up with bite-size you know, lessons that, based on teacher input, will be easier to execute given the realities of at-home learning. Um, I think we'll be learning the entire school year, frankly, like, so uh, bear with us, be patient if you're using the platform, but uh, we will, I think, making it, make it increasingly easy uh, for teachers to manage that process. Um, we tried to make sure that parents needed as little from us as possible. <laughs> um, you know, as teachers were getting kids up and running on the platform, in some cases, they needed to be able to um, help out. Maybe a kid is in kindergarten, but for the most part, kids were able to log on and, and do their own thing. Um, and then the other thing we started moving toward after we got feedback from teachers is project-based learning. 
we're huge believers in this in general. Our platform is set up well for it, but it turns out that that was something that worked for a wide variety of kids in a wide variety of situations. And um, because if you're logging in through our teacher dashboard, kids can share their projects with their teachers. It gave the teachers a way to review those projects on their own time, you know, you know in a way that kind of made sense. So um, again, we're all learning together. We're all getting through this together. I saw some questions about whether discounts will continue into the fall. I think it'll be all over the map. We are continuing to do what we did in the spring. So we're going to be letting our uh, teachers give their students free access for sure through the end of the calendar year and probably, frankly, through the entire school year. Thank you, Grant. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, Clarence. Um, I want to invite everyone now to post your questions in the chat, and I'm going to do my best to find uh, what everybody wants to talk about the most and post that to the panel. But while everyone is doing that, um, we're going to do a little bit of a lightning round here. So um, first, let me just, before, I, before we get ready for the lightning round, guys, uh, can everyone see Clarence's video, by the way? I think he, is he still there? Are you good, Clarence? Yeah? Okay. Um, I can, um, I can see myself. So before I get to the lightning round, I just want to clarify one thing. Okay, great. As long as you can see yourself, we're good. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, I just want to build on, on the last point that Grant made, and that is that um, in terms of the work that Games and Learning is doing, we are hearing that all of the ed tech partners that we work with, they want to find a way to make sure that they're continuing to provide access, particularly to kids in low-income families. Um, and so part of our, our big priority moving into the fall, the number one thing that we're focused on between now and September is trying to find the most efficient, effective, scalable way of doing that across content partners, across outreach partners. Um, and we are, we are, full disclosure, fundraising around a system that will do that um, so that it's not just um, Grant through CodeSpark trying to manage that or Christina with Classroom Inc trying to manage that or Clarence with Bottle, but rather multiple content providers uh, under one roof and having a system where we can connect to multiple outreach partners throughout the country. Um, so that is our number one priority moving into the fall. And the lightning round question is, of all these great things that you all have talked about, what is your number one priority moving into the fall, getting ready for back to school? Um, Clarence, why don't we start with you? Sure, sure, sure. And I think it's very, uh, it's in line with what uh, an audience Ned is talking about too. Like for us, we would like to keep our program free for everyone till the end of time is one of those we have to make sure that we can keep our teammates and ourselves employed. Um, so our main priority right now is the um, product, but then also uh, making sure that we have a the market strategy for the short term, but also for the long run. Um, what we are planning right now is probably going to be a teacher side and then a free trial model on the uh, parent side. So if teachers want to continue using it for free, um, they can. We just have a lot of features that they can um, earn and use um, should the student purchase it. Great. Okay. Thank you, Clarence. Christina, your lightning round question, what's your number one priority moving into the, into the fall? Uh, one of the things we heard from educators, we create long form games. Those are experiences for middle school students that are upwards of 30 minutes. Um, from a teacher standpoint, we're looking to maintain our impact and shrink that to about a 15 minute experience. Uh, what that means is just all we're doing right now is preparing for back to school so that we can release um, our content in a way that's most accessible and most easily used um, and incorporated by, by teachers, no matter where they are um, or where their students are learning. Um, so that is that is the focus at the moment. Got it. Thanks, Christina. Grant, what's your number yeah. one thing? Uh, I have like seven number ones. No, Is that no, okay? No. That's not that's not how a lightning round works, Grant. <laughs> that, that's how I work. But uh, the the main thing we're focused on is um, continuing to make accessing the platform uh, super easy, right? Because of the age group. So if there was one single thing, and and then um, making sure that the teacher management of the platform is also super easy, and so it's lots of little fixes to make the day-to-day -day life of the teacher 
more, you know, more sane, basically. Mm -hmm. um, that, you know, that's, that's our number one. Uh, the other thing from an organizational perspective is we put a, we're putting a ton of energy into supporting charities like human IT that deliver hotspots and devices to kids. Because I think if I were to pick one equity issue, you know, that's uh, crucial right now, it's access. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, those are the two things we're really focused on. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and just to follow up, I think there might have been a question earlier. It's tough to track all the comments, but um, the number that I quoted from Games and Learning, our team uh, analyzed 60 plus uh, school districts and what they reported on distributing. So you can argue that may or may not be actually what hit the ground, but that's what they've reported on distributing. And just in terms of what those 60 plus school districts have reported on distributing, it's over 2.4 million devices at this point. Um, but again, it's growing every day because now, as you know, LA for one has announced 100% remote in the fall. And there are many school districts who are now working towards um, getting closer to that one-to-one -one device to student ratio. Um, yeah. So that number is changing all the time. Um, can I uh, yeah, ahead, answer Grant. a question? Yeah, for, there was a question about data that I think is really important yeah. that, you know, both teachers and parents are worried about data. Yeah. So let me say two things. One, uh, I think a lot of teachers are unaware that districts and states are actually making most of us sign data privacy agreements, which we're happy to do. So there is a very solid national effort underway to protect student data. And I would say there's actually uh, more protections uh, for U.S. students than we've seen in any other market. And we're in many, many countries around the world. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that is happening. And then just most of the platforms, and, and I don't know the super details of like Clarence and Christina's platform, but most of us limit the amount of personal information that can even be entered in the first place. Mm -hmm. So like on CodeSpark Academy, you can't even enter your name if you wanted to as a student. You can only generate a silly name from a name generator. Um, so most of us do both of those things. And it depends a little bit on the age group. Obviously, like you're going to give high school students some more leeway versus a first grader. But um, that is very common and standard practice across our industry. Yeah, that's a great that's a great point, Grant. And I wonder for Clarence and Christina, if you could build on that, because I think it's related to um, what we, the four of us, have talked about before today, which is uh, this fluidity in terms of types of accounts that you have to prepare for, right? So some of you were uh, K to twelve to start with, right? And so your your registration process and all of that. We're not at the end yet, Grant. Don't go anywhere yet. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> Okay, puppy oh, team. Oh, everybody's leaving now. Puppy <laughs> yeah. team, Grant. She, she puppy might team? fall. She might fall asleep. What's her name? Oh, her name is London. We got her two days ago. Oh, geez. yeah. It's a good thing my kid is not seeing this right now because she's lobbying hard. That pandemic, <laughs> pandemic means dog. we fell. I just want you to we fell. You know? <laughs> Nothing happened here. Oh man, <laughs> adorable. Okay, sorry, Michelle. Oh, that's okay. Uh, Puppies yeah, are way more interesting than destroyed the Destroyed your pot. flow. That's okay. Puppies are way better than my where I was going. Um, no, I was going to say this is a very, you know, sort of practical, <laughs> non-puppy-like question. But uh, as we look at, if you were already K-12, right, if that was already your focus, then you had a registration and an account system and all of that that was built for teachers in schools, right, which maybe or maybe not plugged into Clever and Google Classroom and rosters and all that kind of stuff, right, and goes by school kind of data and privacy security requirements. And then I know for Christina, you also have after school programs and groups as an audience, right? And so that's a slightly different setup in terms of accounts and registrations um, versus uh, consumer, right? Which is grant where CodeSparks played for a long time is, is direct, to, direct to consumer, direct to parent and how those types of accounts work. So um, Christina and Clarence, maybe you could give us a little insight into how you've thought about, has your audience changed? over this uh, period of time? Have you had to make adjustments in terms of how you think about data and privacy and accounts because that audience has changed? Clarence, you're nodding your head. Maybe you could. Yes, I mean, our audience has uh, been the same, has been K through six so far. Um, and very similar to what Grant has said. Um, initially, when we built uh, our program, we were 
concerned. So what we did was we made sure we, first of all, obviously encrypt everything, but then uh, in fact, Grant has said we, we don't personal um, information. So it's one of those, God forbid, should we get breached, um, they won't know, you know, records that belong to. Right. Christina, have you had to address any of those challenges? I mean, I, I don't have a ton to add here. I mean, we are middle school. We are targeting students under the age of 13. So we really have to, much of what has been stated um, exists for classroom. And I would just say that uh, the, the one of your last questions was, we really are still focused on our, our teachers, right? We have seen some parents coming in to, to our platform, but the primary audience is, continues to be a B2C. Um, for us, we uh, just a little but for us we we do have a lot of individual partners we're fully philanthropically funded so there's a lot of services that are coming with these partnerships um so for us it is about the clever integrations and and accelerating all of that work as we as we go forward which will also increase the um or just will reinforce i think the security features that we that we have in place right right and there seems to be, um, and we do have about 15 minutes left. So if you have other uh, questions, please feel free to, to post them in the chat. Um, another question that I see or comment from several people here, and I appreciate this, is uh, I'll, I'll summarize it as concern for your companies and organizations that if everything continues to be free, um, how will you be sustainable? And I know, uh, Christina, even though you are a nonprofit, you have that very same issue of sustainability and uh, whether or not your funding sources can be consistent or, or have changed over this time period. Um, so maybe you, you each can address that. Christina, do you wanna, do you wanna start? Classroom Inc is a nonprofit, but you are dependent on funding sources that maybe have other priorities or different ideas for where they should be investing right now. What's your experience? Please. Absolutely. And I will say this, that, you know, pre-COVID, uh, one of our strategic initiatives was around revenue, diversifying our revenue base and revenue generation on the product and services side. Uh, to be really blunt, that's obviously a bit on pause for the time being. And so I would just say we're incredibly fortunate uh, with our existing, um, the foundations that are working uh, with and support Classroom Inc, as well as individual donors that are allowing us to maintain maintain staff, right? We haven't lost anybody. And I've heard you guys are growing for us as a nonprofit. You know, we haven't had the opportunity. We are skinny and slender and working really hard. And so our goal really is to continue to accelerate on the fundraising side and to absolutely have a revenue generation strategy um, or, or implement the revenue generation strategy that we developed um, ideally in the second half of this year, but it's a TBD at the moment. So it's, we're fortunate right now. We're in a really good position right now. We've had a ton of support. Um, I hope that continues and I intend, I think it will continue. We've had a ton of support from teachers, from funders, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, we are meeting a real need, um, but right, long-term, there's a, a lot of other variables at play here, so. Yeah. Uh, Grant, how do you think yeah. about that? And also, I know a, a, a sort of piggyback on that question would be, uh, what's your perception of funders, uh, donors who maybe would put more money in ed tech at this point? Um, do we think that that's likely to happen or what's your experience been so far? Yeah, well, there's so many things, like there's a lot of layers to the onion. But uh, so one thing I'll say, you know, CodeSpark is a profitable, fast growing company. Our revenue has doubled in the last six months. And the reason we're, you know, able to give the product to public schools for free is that we have a healthy subscription business for parents who use the product at home. Now, pre-COVID, there was a very bright line between school use and home use. Now that line is not so bright. Mm -hmm. So we have to figure out how to manage that. But I can say, you know, of all the products that I know that are being used actively um, in K through 12, you know, they don't have advertising, they don't have um, microtransactions, like a lot of the stuff that parents worry about just simply isn't present. Um, that's, it's really not a thing. Um, and we, that's us included. So, you know, I think subscription is probably the growing number one source of revenue for most educational services. If the, if the platform fits that model, um, you know, we also generate about 30% of our revenue outside of North America. So, you know, we're diversified that way as well. Um, 
the other reason we can be, uh, I guess, generous with schools is that we work really hard to make sure we're reaching the schools who need us most. So over 60% of our public school users are Title I schools, right? Who probably wouldn't have access to computer science resources otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, there's a lot of, I guess, financial alchemy that goes into this. Uh, you have to figure out, you know, how to reach users at the right way at the right time in a way that they're willing to pay for. But that model has been working for us. And I, I think we'll probably have to tweak it a little, frankly, uh, in a COVID uh, influenced world, but it, you know, so far so good. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, there's a question, what should parents worry about? They should wor worry about whether the platform does what it says it does. Are the kids actually learning? That's honestly probably the only thing you should care about is, is, you know, is my kid getting something positive out of this? And if so, what is it? And can they explain it to me? Um, and if they can, it's probably a really good use of their time. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, and if they can't, and, you know, maybe you either have to push them harder uh, to get deeper into it or, you know, try something else. That's that's my quick answer to that question. Yeah. Um, yeah. And Clarence, maybe you can build on that. I think one of the other questions was around um, uh, this is, I think, a two part question, but uh, how how to make sure that we're engaging um, across cultures, across different types of families, across different types of needs, right? How, how are you tuned in to trying to make sure that what you're doing is providing the kind of learning outcomes that Grant has described and also is able to engage all kinds of learners in all kinds of environments? How do you think about that? That's a really good question. It seems a little bit too I know big you for do me. think about it, Claire. <laughs> yeah, I do think about it a lot. Um, yeah, uh, the first thing I would say in terms of um, making, I think it's, it's really important if you're providing an educational resource because it's education important that you you have to be able to accommodate everyone, right? So for us, you know, we were so lucky to get a grant and at, when we got a grant, it was like we knew exactly what we're going to use. We're going to use it for um, text to speech, um, accessibility issues, mobile. we knew we had to um, um, translate it to ESP to other languages so that everybody can benefit from it. That is um, one of our main priorities. Um, in terms of the educational outcomes, it's going to be one of those we, we still have to test, we still have to like uh, verify it. But I think one thing that we have going for us in this game space is that, you know, more than anything before, games are now like on very, very high demand, whether it's outside of the education market um, as well as in the education market as well. So that's kind of like where I think able to engage the student, there's ways to sneak in um, um, outcomes. So I, I think as, as long as they're using it, you we can tweak it, we can find it, um, and, and there are ways for us to really constantly, but that's, I think the market is proving as long as engagement is there, um, that's where you can start towards an upward trajectory. Mm -hmm. And Christine, thank you, Clarence. And I, and Christina, I know you spend a lot of time in thinking about your, making sure that your product development is culturally relevant and, and reaching a diverse group of students. And you're, you're targeting slightly older students than what Clarence and Grant's products are. So how do you think about that goal as well as the learning outcomes that you're, that you're tracking? Yeah, I would say in terms of both um, ensuring and communicating impact, a couple of things. Um, we literally in the last couple of weeks received a digital promise grant on their learner variability study. This is research is essential and core to all of the work that we do as a nonprofit. There's nothing more important than impact. Um, and I would argue that for all of us here sitting in, in, in this panel. Um, and so uh, for us, it really is about we have formative data um, within within the platform um, concurrently, and we're always doing external data to to compare um, the, the gains of our students or read to lead students with students who didn't use read to lead. I think the learner variability uh, digital promise work is actually extremely exciting because it builds on the literacy piece, but it's also setting us up to design a platform for social emotional learning gains um, and skills, which I think are when we think about the whole child uh, that that trifecta. Um, that I was sharing earlier. Uh, we want to make sure that we're elevating that learning for students in real time and obviously for teachers who we believe are, are in, in terms of what we're designing, are continue to facilitate that, that learning experience for students. Mm -hmm. Great. 
So in the last, we just have a few minutes left. So I wonder if each of you could think about the feedback that you've gotten from your audience over the past couple of months. And I know we all hear from customers on a daily basis, right? From kids as well as parents and teachers. And think about what, what types of comments or what types of stories have you heard in the past few months that you carry with you in the work that you're doing and in thinking about going into the fall, right? And, and I, I believe it's true for all of us that in order to do this work, we have to have those stories, right? We, we, we have to be reminding ourselves all the time of the individual people who are coming to us and saying, this is what's working for me or this is what's not working for me. Um, so I wonder if each of you could maybe share um, some of the input that you've gotten and the kinds of things that you keep top of mind. Christina, you, you, I think maybe you have something already to go. Um, I think, um, yeah, oh, go ahead. There you go. No, you're back. You're, you're okay. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I would say particularly in the last couple of months, the stories that are coming back to us and the feedback from teachers have really been on the cultural, culturally relevant side. Um, mm -hmm. Our diverse character of content out there is reflective in any way, shape, or form of the diversity of this country. And so to have teachers sending us notes to say, A, thank you for keeping my, keeping my students engaged in learning, and B, for allowing them to see themselves in the stories that you've created has been incredibly powerful, um, has always been, but has really been reinforced over these last couple of months. And um, so that is one of many I could go on, but that one, that one is top of mind in yeah. particular. Yeah. How about you, Grant? What keeps you going, except for, besides the besides the puppy, yeah. which would be well, a good incentive for me to get up in the morning. <laughs> the puppy is a good one. No, it, yeah. you know, it, it comes down to um, usually like individual stories. So, two, one, there's a teacher uh, who you know, black woman in Texas that uses the platform, and um, when we launched what we call Food Creator, which is our system for creating your own characters that can then be used in games and stories. We got a really lovely, you know, email from her about how excited her own daughter was to be able to build characters with um, African American hairstyles, right? Mm. And it might seem like a small thing, but when you constantly are looking for that and not seeing it in front of you, it's a big thing, right? And so we spend a lot of time making sure we're we're thinking about that stuff. And then the other story for me is actually um, um, a mom who, who wrote in her son is autistic and, and legally blind. And he uses the platform to make these really intricate stories um, and is very entertained and his coding is amazing. Um, and, um, you know, for me, it's like reaching that one kid in a way that really works for them makes it all worth it like that's what i think about when i get up and and that's what those are the stories that i share with the team you know um and so um so those are the things you know we just we focus on the bright spots we know we have a ton of things that we could do better but we're doing a lot of things right and and we try to make sure we remind ourselves of that and then we make our list of the 10 things we need to fix and we put our heads down and keep working on it yeah. Thank you, Grant. Clarence, what do you think? Yeah, similar to um, uh, Grant's feedback, we get a lot of like, you know, hey, this is so engaging for, for our classroom. Things that really like hit home and the ones I love to share to are the individual. The first one that comes to mind is going to be the one from uh, an after school program. Uh, a lot of, we work with a lot of after schools as well because um, Share the same data from teachers and the after school coordinators so that I have to try to do a lot of assessment and testing. Um, there's, a, a, I guess I shouldn't mention names, there's a kid, um, fourth grader, Title I school. The, the coordinator would tell me that because he's so behind. Um, and then you, after using our program, because our program, the kids' gaps are, um, he used it for about two months and then they told me, oh, he is. In, in math, he's telling everybody to call him math boy. Uh, so <laughs> stories like that, yeah, it's just like really, really heartwarming. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, fantastic. Okay, three minutes. Anybody have anything they want to promote? What should we go look for? Uh, Bottle has some exciting news, 
right, Clarence? You just raised yes. another round. Yes, we just raised another round, um, and we're we'll, you be using the funding to grow our team, grow our support, really um, executing all of the feedback that we've got from teachers and parents. Um, so, mobile version is going to be coming out. Really excited for that. Excellent. So is my daughter. Very cool. Congrats, Clarence. Uh, Christina, exciting things people should watch for from Classroom Inc. Similar, we just received a grant uh, yesterday from AT&T to accelerate our product development uh, work. Um, so all of that fabulous work that we're talking about for back to school um, just got a nice boost. So kudos to AT&T and uh, will allow us to reach more teachers and students. Excellent. Congrats, Christina. Grant, what do you um, look for from Coach Park? Well, I Besides wish there, the great plush that you're going to yeah, share with Clarence, because the, the plush is awesome. <laughs> there's some secret stuff that I can't talk about. But uh, the one thing I can talk about is we just started work on our biggest update to our game creator platform uh, since the original launch of that platform. And so it's a, it's a whole new way to create games that uh, we're pretty confident kids are gonna be super excited about. And that should roll out just before um, Thanksgiving. Excellent. All right, well, I wanna thank the panelists. You all have been amazing. Uh, we were a little nervous about, and the puppy. Uh, we're all a little nervous about the technology coming in. Thank you to Games for Change for making it all work smoothly. Um, I also just want to mention that uh, these developers are all part of a larger community of Games for Learning content providers, uh, folks that we're all talking to every day. Um, and they're working so hard to try to make sure that they're doing what's right for parents and teachers and kids. So kudos to everybody. So great to Thanks, see Michelle. you here. Enjoy the thanks puppy. Thanks for coming and listening to us, everybody. Yeah, mm -hmm. thanks, everybody. Enjoy the rest of the festival. There's your puppy moment. Yay, puppy <laughs> moment. <laughs> <laughs> Take care, everyone. All right. See you guys. Bye, all.